Okay, welcome back, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Alex Yukis. Uh, he will talk about an approach to characterizing the local Langlands conjecture over Piatic fields. Thank you very much. I want to begin by thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here. So everything I'm going to be talking about today is joint with Alexander bertoloni melli who will actually soon be a, a happy member of the uh, Michigan Math Department. Um, so I want to begin with sort of a very, oh, actually, sorry, I forgot I wanted to notation first. So I'm going to use the following notation throughout the entire talk. So for me, F will always be a piatic local field. I'm going to use O to denote the ring of integers and K the residue field. G will always be a reductive group over F. For basically everything I'll say, I'm going to assume it's quasi-split, but that's mostly out of convenience and necessity. Um, G hat will denote the dual group, and LG will denote the they form of the L group. So G hat some indirect product WF. Okay. So I'm going to start out with a sort of intentionally vague definition. So for me, a Langlands correspondence for G is going to be a finite one association that takes in admissible representations of G of F and spits out L parameters. And of course, I don't want it to be arbitrary. I want it to satisfy some list of properties, but those properties I want to get to later. So for right now, I just want to take this as a very broad definition. And as per usual, if I have a Langlands correspondence, then for me, uh, an L packet is going to be the pre-image of a parameter under this map. So it's going to be a finite set associated to any given L parameter psi. Okay, so before I continue, I want to give some examples because this will come up later. So remember, everything I'm talking about here is purely in the piatic situation. I'm not going to talk about function fields at all. So the local Langlands correspondence is actually a conjecture in general, but is known in many cases. So in the case of GSGLM, it was originally done by the work of Harris Taylor. Uh, simplification of the proof was given by any art. And then Schultz in a 2013 paper gave an alternative way to view this. And in some sense, that's what this talk is a natural generalization of. Uh, in the case of SP2N and SO2N plus one, Arthur's work on endoscopy allowed him to complete the conjecture for those two cases. Extending these ideas, Mock was able to do it also in the case of quasi-split unitary groups. For arbitrary unitary groups, essentially, um, it can be extended by the work of Kaletha, Minges, Shin, and White. And as a last example, in the case of GSP4, the work of Ghana Takeda takes care of the uh, conjecture. Okay. So the real question we should ask if you look at my definition of local Langlands correspondence is, what are these lists of properties that we wanted to satisfy? And what I'm more interested in specifically for this talk is, do those properties uniquely characterize the correspondence? So if you have two correspondences that satisfy the same list of properties, do they in fact have to be the equal? So as an example of what I mean by that, even though this will not look like our final result, in the case of GLN, the standard things that you want the local Langlands correspondence to satisfy are compatibility with tensor products, local class field theory, L functions and epsilon factors. And of course, it's well known in that case that those do in fact uniquely characterize the correspondence. So it's those kind of things, even though that's not what our result will ultimately look like. So to give you a flavor of what the result we're actually aiming for is, I'm going to go back to this 2013 paper of Schultz. So before I actually explain it literally what's written in the slide, let me tell you intuitively what's happening. So for every representation pi, we get a parameter LL pi. And if you want to think about uniquely pinning down what that parameter has to be, you might imagine that since it's something like a Galois representation, if I tell you the trace of tau on LL pi for all tau, then you would know what LL pi is. Let's ignore semi-simplicity issues right now. But that's essentially what one might imagine. And so you could think that if for every tau, if I had a corresponding element f tau of the Hecke algebra, it makes sense to take the trace of that f tau on pi and compare it to the trace of tau on LL pi. So you might ask for every tau, is there an f tau such that the trace of f tau on pi equals the trace of tau on LL pi? Because if there was, then those f taus would uniquely pin down the correspondence. For reasons that are not too hard to see though, such a function could never actually be a compactly supported smooth function. And so what one has to do in actuality is add in a sort of cutoff that could make F tau really possibly exist. So the actual setup here is that for every tau in WF plus, and it doesn't matter this WF plus right now, just ignore the plus. And for every H, which is an element of the compactly supported smooth function zone GLNO, so GLNO is a maximal compact subgroup, so it is something like a cutoff function. To every pair tau and h, you can associate a function f tau h in the Hecke algebra for GL and f, such that um, the matching of the traces essentially happens with possibly this cutoff function added in. So the trace of f tau h on pi is the trace of tau on LL pi with a character twist that I'm going to ignore times the trace of h on pi. And in fact, this uniquely characterizes the correspondence. Okay, 
So I want to say a very quick word about these functions at tau h, because in some sense, they're not the um, focus of this talk, but something should at least be said. So really, these functions exist in greater generality. And really, there should be a decoration of a mu on the f tau h, because they depend on a mu. In the GLN case, it was the standard 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. So sort of they kind of, you can safely ignore it. But in general, it should be f tau h mu, even though I will oftentimes forget to use that. So where do they come from? They come from a geometric place. So one way to describe them, and I'm not going to get into this in full, but you can describe them in terms of cohomology of tubular neighborhoods inside of certain Rappaport zinc spaces. Why do they actually uh, input into Langlands? Well, there's lots of reasons that you can answer that. But for me, oftentimes, the reason is they show up naturally in a global framework of the langlands cotwood schultz method, which essentially attempts to understand what the trace of the galois cross hecke action is on the cohomology Schmor varieties in terms of orbital integrals, twisted orbital integrals, things that you can apply the arthur selberg trace formula to. And so those functions show up there, which is oftentimes the tie-in for me, because as we know, it's expected that the cohomology of Schmorer variety should decompose in terms of Langlands. Um, and I should say that these F tau H's, even though I sort of wrote them only in the GLM case before, they exist in greater generality. So in, in many PEL situations, they're written down by work of Schulze, and in forthcoming work of myself, they can be written down in essentially any abelian type situation once you define that correctly. Okay. So once you have these generalizations of the F tau H's that occur in um, Schultz's GLN case, you can ask whether or not a trace-like identity holds in these generalized situations. And the conjecture of Schultz and Shin in their JAMS paper essentially says this. So what it says is for uh, an arbitrary group G that's unramified, because you do need a model for this to work, um, for every tau and every h and for every mu, you do get a function f tau h mu. Again, I'm suppressing the mu such that inequality that roughly looks like Schultz's trace equation holds with two minor differences, but important ones. So here, by s theta, essentially what I'm doing is I'm not taking the trace of f tau h on the left and h on the right on a single pi. What I'm really doing is taking the sum of the traces. It's weighted, but I'm going to ignore that. Taking the sum of the traces over the entire packet for pi. So in some sense, the terms on the left and right-hand side roughly look the same, except now I'm summing over the entire packet for pi, sorry, for psi. And the second difference is, since now psi is uh, a parameter for g, it doesn't make sense to take the trace, but it does make sense to take the trace after you compose with the representation. And so I have this r minus mu here, which essentially is for a given mu, the representation of the L group for g, whose restriction in g hat has highest weight mu check. And even though I didn't denote it here, the mu that appears on the right-hand side should be uh, the mu that appears on the left-hand side is the superscript for f tau h. Okay, so once you have this conjecture, there's sort of two natural questions that one can ask. The first is, does the schultz schin conjecture hold for other groups than GLN? And if you do know that it holds for groups other than GLN, does it actually uniquely characterize the correspondence? So in the GLN case, this was not hard to see, but in more general situations, it's an issue. In some sense, it's the second question I'm going to focus on today. But before I get to that, I want to say something about the first uh, question, which is what cases are, is it known to hold? So in some PEL cases, if you know what this means, essentially EL type plus epsilon, it's known to hold by work of Schultz and Schultz and Shim. Um, appropriately interpreted, it holds in the cases of G equals D cross. But as I wrote before, G has to be unramified, so it doesn't quite make sense. But as long as you appropriately interpret it, uh, work of Shen shows that it holds in the D-cross situation. Uh, and in work of uh, Bertoloni, Melli, and myself, you can show that it holds true in the case of unramified unitary groups. So there are some cases beyond GLN where the conjecture is at least known to hold this trace identity, the schultz schen equation. Um, and so now I want to talk about, if you do know it in some cases, how far away is it from actually characterizing? So I'm now going to give the setup for the main result, which essentially is going to tell us that with some extra properties assumed about the local Langlands correspondence, the schultz schen equations are enough to uniquely characterize it. But first, I need to give some setup about exactly what objects are going to appear in the rigorous statement. So I'm not going to be interested in all L parameters. I'm right now going to only be interested in supercuspidal L parameters. And so I'm calling L parameter supercuspidal if A, its image does not lie in any proper parabolic subgroup of the L group of G. And the second is that the restriction of size to the SL2C factor is trivial. And the slogan you should think of is that supercuspidal L parameters are those whose L package exists entirely of supercuspidals. Okay. The second thing I'm going to need to talk about is that in the statement of our main theorem, we talk about hyperendoscopic groups. 
So if you're familiar with endoscopy, then an extended elliptic hyperendoscopic group is really just an iteration of the ideas of elliptic endoscopy. You take G, you take an elliptic endoscopic group of that, an elliptic endoscopic group of that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you're not familiar with endoscopy at all, very roughly what you should think about these hyperendoscopic groups are, is they are a, a, a set of groups for which an L parameter of G could possibly factorize through, and somehow it's a large enough set to often study the actual packet structure. Um, so study the individual terms of a packet opposed to the entire packet on itself. And just as an example, um, if G is the unitary group, then the elliptic hyperendoscopic groups in this case are really just products of smaller unitary groups. And note here that it really is important that we're working with elliptic. If you take away this word elliptic, things get a lot more crazy. And so the fact that we're able to deal with just elliptic here is what makes, for example, the unitary group, uh, uh, excuse me, the unitary group case uh, as simple as it appears here. Okay. So now I want to actually get to the sort of things I'm considering. So before I said something roughly like a local Langlands correspondence was an association of uh, parameters to pi's. And so what I'm going to be talking about is what we're calling a supercuspidal local Langlands correspondence. And so now, instead of thinking about it as associating parameters to pi's, I'm going to think about it conversely as associating packets to parameters. And I'm not interested in all parameters. Like I said, we're only going to be interested in equivalence classes of supercuspidal L parameters for H, where H is a hyperendoscopic group. And what it's going to output is a finite subset of supercuspidal representations of H of F. And note here that even though I'm calling this a supercuspidal local Langlands correspondence for G, um, I'm really actually getting one for every hyperendoscopic group H. So I'll talk about that more in a second. But now I really want to list for you the properties that are going to be important for me. The first is that I want disjointness of the packets. So if you want to turn this on its head and actually get an association of parameters to representations, of course you need the packets to be disjoint, to say uniquely that a, a pi could come from a psi. The second condition is something that's standard and what's usually called the refined um, local Langlands correspondence, and there's lots of motivation for it, but I'm not going to go into it here. It's that there's a bijection. It depends on the choice of a Whitaker datum, but I'm ignoring that here. There's a bijection between the packet for psi and something like the irreducible representations of the component group of a reduced centralizer of psi. Okay, so that's something that generally shows up as a natural condition in the local Langlands correspondence, at least the refined one. The third condition is what we're calling the stability condition. So as of now, if you take a psi and you look at the packet for psi, there's no reason that a sum or a weighted sum over that packet should actually be a stable distribution. And so we're assuming that the stable character you get really is a distribution, something like the sum of the trace distributions over the packet for psi. And the final and probably most important is that I want to assume that the endoscopic character identities hold. So the way you should think about this, because I'm not going to really say explicitly what the endoscopic character identities are, is the following. As of now, I have a correspondence that should work for any hyperendoscopic group, but there's lots of those, and a priori they don't talk to each other. And so what you want to know is that these pi h's for various h's actually talk. And so what the endoscopic character identity says is that if I, for example, take a parameter uh, psi for g, and it factorizes through an h, I want somehow that a stable character for the factorization and a character for G to somehow relate to each other. And what that really means at a very vague level is that this ECI tells you how the pi H's for various H's interact with one another and gives you some sort of cohesion. Okay, so with this data uh, set up, oops, I forgot one more thing. Um, we do need to actually have a definition of schultz shin datum. And unlike before where we have these explicit uh, functions F tau H mu that you can construct from geometry, we're allowing sort of like um, a slight abstraction and allowing us to have any set of functions that are sort of indexed by the same data. So I'm going to take a schultz shin datum to be any collection of functions phi tau h mu, depending on dominant co-characters mu for all hyperendoscopic groups, um, tau that are in the um, vague group for the reflex field of those mu's, and h's that are in some um, HECA algebra for a compact open subgroup of h of f. So just think about this as like, F tau H mu's for all the H's that are hyperendoscopic groups of G, but they don't really have to be the specific functions I mentioned could be constructed before. Right now, they're just sort of abstract things. And we say that a supercuspidal local Langlands correspondence satisfies the schultz shin equations relative to this data if what we know is true is a trace equation exactly like in the schultz shin conjecture holds in that case. Uh, notice here, uh, there's actually a typo. On the left-hand side, there should be a declaration of a mu on the superscript for phi tau H. 
But if you look at this, a schultz shin datum is just an abstraction of the notion of what the f tau h mu's represent. And the schultz shin equations are exactly the equations that show up in the schultz shin conjecture for those objects. Okay, so with this setup, I can state precisely the result that uh, me and my co-author were able to prove, which is if G is a good group, which is a restriction I'll talk about in the next slide, and pi one and pi two are two supercuspal Langlands correspondences for G, which satisfy the schultz shin equations for the same datum, then in fact, not only are the two um, local Langlands correspondences the same, but so are the bijections that show up in the um, bijection axiom. So the bijections between the irreducible representations for the component group of the reduced centralizer and the packet. And so the way you should look at this is saying that um, at least if you assume that some other basic axioms about your Langlands correspondences uh, hold true, then you can in fact show that the schultz shin datum and the schultz shin equations are enough. Okay, so what is this good assumption? So if you look at the schultz shin equations, really the only things that ever show up are r minus mu composed with size, right? And so the point is, if you ever want to have a hope of recovering psi, you better hope that you can recover a psi from its knowledge of its composition with all r minus mu's. So group G is good if somehow you can recover a psi by knowing its composition with all these irreducible representations. So some examples of good groups and non-examples are GLN, UN, SO2N plus one, PGLN, and G2 are examples of good groups, whereas SLN, SO2N, SP2N, and E8 are non-examples. So I'll say something later about how maybe in theory one could remove this goodness assumption. Okay. So I want to give you a very brief idea about how you actually prove the result because it ends up being something that um, is not too difficult uh, once you set it up correctly. So I'm going to assume in the most basic case that we start with the assumption that we have pi is a single representation, which is both a packet for pi one and a packet for pi two, possibly with respect to different parameters. So I want to prove those parameters have to actually be the same. And what you see is taking an H small enough so that the character um, uh, of pi on H is non-zero and dividing through the schultz shin equations, you get that the trace of tau on R minus mu psi is equal to the trace of tau on R minus mu composed psi prime for all tau. And by our goodness assumption, this actually allows us to recover that psi is equal to psi prime. The second thing, this is very important, is using a suggestion of Haraga, we're able to show that, um, in fact, if you just assume those four properties we had about supercuspal local Langlands correspondences, you actually get what we're calling atomic stability, which means that if you have a set of representations and some linear combination of them is stable, then in fact that S must be a unit of L packets. So here's what that implies. If I have a pi that's a packet for pi one, so it's pi one psi, I know by my assumptions that theta pi has to be stable. But then by atomic stability for pi two, theta pi being stable means that pi is also a packet for pi two. And so now if I start with the assumption that pi one of psi is some pi, by the second bullet, that pi must also be pi two of psi prime, but then by the first bullet, psi is equal to psi prime. So in some sense, what this shows is that pi, big pi one and big pi two agree on psi that have singleton packets. And then the point of the hyperendoscopy is the fact that it may not be true that every psi has a singleton packet, but by factorizing it maximally through a hyperendoscopic group, you can sort of reduce to the case where you're in the singleton packet situation. So you somehow reduce to that case at the end anyways. So I just want to give an application. So if you are working with an unramified unitary group, since me and my co-author were able to prove the schultz shin conjecture holds in that case, um, using the local Langlands correspondence of Mach, and you know that uh, the unitary group is a good group, you in fact then know that uh, not only does the schultz shin conjecture hold, but it does uniquely characterize the correspondence in that case. Okay, so I just wanna finish with some um, thoughts and further directions. So this result is somewhat reminiscent of a stable version of the Laforgue's lemma, um, the, the one that's following from the work of Richardson. Stable in the sense that instead of having something for each pi, we're only working with things over sums of packets. Um, the stable version is useful, at least for us, because in most times, if you're working with the local Langlands correspondence that maybe has a geometric nature, sorry, not a geometric nature, a global nature, that maybe uses the Arthur Subberg trace formula, it's oftentimes easier to access stable characters than unstable things. And so the stable version tends to be useful. But it also, um, comparison, comparing to Vila Forg's lemma, um, makes you ask two natural questions, which is this good group assumption is annoying. And perhaps what one can do is, remove the good group assumption if you allow instead of Schultz's shin datum, 
uh, datum that's indexed by more general objects. So for example, if you're familiar with Vila Forg's lemma, objects indexed by the i, f, gamma, i's um, that he has there. And the other comparison is thinking about what Lefort applies it to, whether or not there's a useful version of the result in the function field setting. Because certainly as of now, a lot of the things we're saying and use um, only really make sense in the piatic situation. Okay, um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The clapping happens in the chat. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I love a good uh, chat clap. Thank you for listening to your talk. Okay, let me wait a short moment so people can type questions in the Q&A or raise their hand. Okay, so there's already one question. Let me ask that. Uh, what does the supercuspidal local Langlands correspondence of G say about the local Langlands correspondence of G? So this is, I think, an incredibly good question. So I don't really know a complete answer to this. This is something that uh, we've thought about, but, oh, it seems like Lauren Spice would like to answer the question. I don't know how that works. What? Oh, it's- No, 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 no. Okay, can, I, 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 was, I, I was just dismissing it, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, so, yeah, so, I don't really know the full answer to this question. In cases, for example, like GLN, where you have a really good theory of segments and you sort of know exactly how to relate supercuspitals very easily to non-supercuspitals for different GLNs, you can actually say something explicitly for the general Langlands correspondence from something like the supercuspital case. Um, and in fact, if you look at Schultz's original paper, he does do that. A lot of the work he does in his original 2013 paper is dealing with sort of the non-supercuspital case. In general, I'm not totally positive, but I think it's expected that like you should be able to, at least with enough good axioms, promote something from a supercuspital local Langlands correspondence to a full local Langlands correspondence. There was also a question in the chat. I'm just trying to find it because of the clap clap. <laughs> um, the question is, is the good condition related to what Larson called acceptable? Yeah, I mean, Yes, it's very related. In some sense, it's it's not exactly equivalent because you might be worried, for example, that if you take a group that shows up um, for Larson, whether or not you can realize the counterexample for a given group as a quotient of a WF. But yes, it's it's highly related. Okay, thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker again, and we have a five-minute break then. <laughs>